good to go. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome this morning. Um, we're going to present to you about <coughs> how we decided to architecture the, the control plane of our OpenStack installations. We took a little bit a different approach than what most of um, the bigger referential um, architectures are showing. Nevertheless, it's it's quite similar to a few of the other um, control planes that you might have seen already being presented um, at this summit. So uh, my name is Marcel Harry. I work for Swisscom. That's not a picture of me, but it's familiar to me. <laughs> I'm leading the architecture of Swisscom's Elastic Stack. This is um, our stack based on OpenStack and um, our platform as a service solution which is based um, on Cloud Foundry. I'm a member of Cloud Foundry's Technical Advisory Board. Swisscom is also part of Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, I have a background in automating all the things like various automation tools, um, Linux system engineering. So I am Alberto Garcia. I work for Red Hat as Cloud Architect. Uh, I joined Red Hat kind of one year and a half ago, but I've been working with emerging technologies for the last five years. And in a previous life, I was a network engineer, so I have a good background on network stuff as well. Yeah, and um, <laughs> Alberto was on site with yeah. us, um, and that's um, how it sta everything started. So um, if we look a little bit about wh wh why did we have um, to build our OpenStack and then also reason a little bit about the motivation behind our decisions is maybe let's have a first look at the use cases. Um, one of the, the very early drivers was um, deploying Cloud Foundry on top of OpenStack. Cloud Foundry is a very um, distributed system really built to run in a cloud native fashion and it provides a platform to run cloud native applications. So there is one offering that we have on developerswisscom.com. It's our public platform as a service offering. Everybody can go there, sign up and uh, start pushing applications. However, we're also using this platform to de um, develop new services on top one of the services that was then start, started being built and which was also a huge driver in the requirements behind um, the platform that we built is the product MyCloud. It's, um, it's a cloud storage solution being provided to um, all our re residential customers as part of their plans and um, it provides you with official marketing term infinite storage. So <clears throat> if we look a little bit of how Swisscom um, looks at IT and how we would like to produce it, it's, um, we think, you sh we believe very strongly in a um, for CICD approach. So meaning that we automate a lot of the things um, or let's say all the things we also have multiple stages where we then test um, the new releases that come out, either whether it's new software releases, but also new automation releases. This gives us a way to A, have rapid release cycles, so we can iterate quickly on new features, on bugs, fixing bugs, and, um, but it also gives us like really confidence in what we're pushing because um, things are going to be tested up front. And one, one of the things is where we see Cloud Foundry and OpenStack be um, within our um, IT environment, it's, it, we really see it as the platform to build the next generation workload um, at Swisscom. So, it's the platform for cloud native <coughs> applications, um, highly automated microservice like architecture. And um, so when, when we, with that in mind, that's also how we looked at um, 
when deploying OpenStack? So, what we do usually see in the OpenStack deployment, we see a monolithic controller cluster with all the control players running on top of a pacemaker cluster, fixed number of, uh, of bare metal nodes. But we were aiming for something different, something closer that we that we, we see in uh, cloud aware workloads, something agile, something dynamic, a platform that can be plugged into the CI CD pipeline, something that we can operate with modern uh, uh, operation methodologies. But we ask ourselves, we, we don't see this usually in production environments. Is it possible? Is it doable? Is OpenStack prepared for that? Is the IHA model pre prepared for that? So let's go through the analysis with it to figure it out. So the OpenStack control plane. OpenStack is a fully distributed system. It keeps services as decoupled as possible. So you think about it, how OpenStack services integrate with each other. It, they, they use the RPC, which is the message through the message bus. They use API calls. They use the database. These are well-known mechanisms to decouple modern applications. So yeah, it allows dynamic topologies. So, you think, well, you, it does not matter if you have one API, 100 APIs, the communication is through a, through a load balancer, so you are pointing a VIP, so it, it does not matter. And the coordination of the non-API or the non-API components is done, is done through the RPC, through RPC calls and uh, RPC CAS. So you can have multiple components, one single one, it does not matter. So, uh, yeah, control plane services can virtualize. So if you think about it, it does not demand um, kind of a, how to say it, how to phrase it, it does not demand huge resources. So it, you can deploy a Cinder API with just one virtual CPU and two gigs of, of memory. You, you don't have, it's open source, you don't have this uh, kind of direct binding with licensing between the service and the, and the server where you are going. So it's a good candidate to be, to be virtualized. And you have dedicated projects to automate the deployment of the, of the services. So, that means that the OpenStack control plane can be managed as a code, and you can plug it. In, you can plug it into the CI/CD. So, given that OpenStack has been developed following the modern application methodologies, so it, this is exactly what we were looking for. So, yeah. So, the chain model. All of you know the pacemaker chain model is the one that is documented in in the OpenStack high availability guide. Uh, it consists of uh, usually a, a three bare metal node pacemaker cluster with all the control plane services running on, on top. It's something that it has been proven in production. You know that it works, but uh, we found some limitations that we, wo did, we didn't want to include in our architecture. So this deployment has all the services in the same cluster, so you cannot scale it as it is. You have RabbitMQ, you have Galera, you have MongoDB. Those services do replication. So if you put more, 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 more servers, you will have more, 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 more replication overhead and less performance. So if you have, if you have all the services running, so you have dozens of, dozens of services running on the same node, the, the resource requirements get higher, isn't it? So if you translate these requirements to virtual hardware requirements, you will end up in huge virtual machines that are not good for virtual environments because they are harder to operate. You don't want to have a virtual machine that has the same number of virtual CPUs than your, than your hypervisor, isn't it? So life cycle of bare metal is, is low. So you can, it's not a good uh, model to have in, in a virtual environment, so you have to, to move to bare metal. And some companies need months to have uh, hardware ready for consumption. So it's not something, if you tomorrow need to, need to scale one controller node, you won't get a, a new hardware rack connected to the network and so on in hours. This is not going to happen. So the CI CD is more complex. Uh, you have to deal with pacemaker concepts when you are interacting in, new, in, uh, in individual components. You have to care about the constraints. I cannot, uh, I cannot restart Keystone service because you, I have some constraints and I'm going to restart also Cinder. I'm going to restart also Nova. So the, the, it's, it's something that can be automated, but it's a bit harder that you don't use pacemaker. And the whole point, clustering software is straightforward. This is the whole point. 
the cluster software is taking care about the status of the members of the cluster, taking care of the status of the services that are running on the cluster. We were aiming for something more stateless, something that follows these modern principles, and it binds to the control plane. Okay, if you deploy it in bare metal, it's clear that it's directly, it has a direct de dependency with the, with the underlying infrastructure. But even if you deploy it in, the, in a virtual machine, you have these Estonian resources to, uh, to restart the nodes in case of failure that requires that you configure a user, a password in the virtual environment, direct access to the API of the virtual environment. So you, you have this direct binding. You, you cannot port this application to other virtual environment without changing configuration and so on. So yeah, not the best HA model for what we were aiming for. So we look for another option. And Looking for, for alternatives, we found the so-called HA proxy Kipal ID model. Uh, our colleague, Javier Peña, that is an uh, engineer at, uh, at Red Hat, has uh, documented this architecture in this link that you can see there, this GitHub uh, document. It's uh, it based on the belief that, that you don't need a clustering software taking care of the OpenStack services. So it's a pacemaker-free architecture. Thanks to that, you can distribute the components because you don't, you don't have this glue that is, a, it, that is a cluster. You don't have this glue. You don't have to, you, you are not um, kind of orchestrating the startup of the services based on constraints. So you can just split out the control plane in different, uh, in different uh, smaller roles. And as you can split the control plane in smaller roles, virtualization makes more sense because you can create a small roles with a small hardware resources uh, requirement that can fit well in any virtual environment. And of course, it does not bind application to, to infrastructure because you can virtualize it and you don't have any interaction between the, the application layer and the underlying hardware. So, so is it doable? <coughs> so we, we looked at it and tried to design it a little bit. So um, what we aimed for was a distributed and virtualized control plane, meaning that we can pull the pieces apart, as Alberto explained, into individual components. Um, we wanted to look at um, the individual components as horizontal scalable services wherever possible. We will come back to that later. As well as, so the foundation of that to iterate quickly is uh, definitely a virtualized control plane because um, there we, we can iterate way faster. And um, it was kind of clear that we wanted to isolate shared state, meaning um, the MySQL database <coughs> within a Galera cluster and RabbitMQ on their own. So, double chain. We leverage the, the virtual HA, the virtual machine HA capabilities of the virtual infrastructure. So if a hypervisor where your virtual machine is running goes down, the virtual machine gets automatically migrated to a healthy hypervisor. So hardware failures handled. And also we configure anti-infinity rules so we ensure that the same so that virtual machines that belong to the same role don't run on the same hypervisor. So if one hypervisor goes down, you don't you don't lose a, a complete service. And the application level HA is something that looks familiar for everyone because it's more or less the same principle of pacemaker, but without pacemaker. So what we don't have here is that if a service goes down, the service will be down till something goes there and start at the service. It can be an operator, it can be an automated, um, automated code or, or whatever. So for the web-based services, APIs, the dashboard, we use HA proxy. HA proxy distributes the load and plus does uh, monitoring to the backends. So if a backend stops responding to the monitors, it just drops down the, the server from the backend. We use Kipal ID because we don't have a, a clustering software that handles the virtual IPs. So we need something to, to provide um, uh, HA to the virtual IP. So we use Kipal ID. Kipal ID is based on BRRP. This is a well-known network protocol to, to provide HA to virtual IPs. And it also monitors HA proxy. So, so if HA proxy is stopped, Kipal ID stops sending the multicast BRRP messages. So this node won't be eligible to be, to be the master of the VIP. Galera cluster for MySQL, 
Galera cluster is, a, is an active, active, synchronous cluster, but uh, all we know that we cannot configure it in active, active, because some OpenStack projects do uh, select for updates queries. This creates blocks in the database, so we have to configure it in active standby using HAProxy in the middle. For MongoDB, a quick and easy replica set. For RabbitMQ, the nat native RabbitMQ clustering with uh, replicated queues. For Redis, in the pacemaker, model, Redis is handled by, by Pacemaker, but we don't have Pacemaker, so we are using Sentinel. If you look at the you know, common HA configuration of, of Redis, Sentinel is always there. So full of information, yeah, upstream, and the non-AP components, is, I will say, as, as I said, we the, this model is based on the belief that you don't need to provide HA to the OpenStack services, so they coordinate themselves with RPC and the state in the database. So if we um, <coughs> then look at um, the individual components in the overall OpenStack, we can actually like yeah um, differentiate between the main two things, the control plane and, and the compute resources. For the compute resources, we went with a hyperconverged approach. Um, we, we have hardware that has quite a lot of disk and as well as memory um, on a high density factor form. Also, um, the compute nodes, or actually on every node, um, we have 10 gig cards with, um, where we do bonding for the network HA to, to the different switches. <laughs> In general, within our data center, we go with a layer three spine leaf design, meaning that um, we terminate layer two at the top of the rack, and then everything else is routed over um, the spine and the leaf switches. The compute nodes, they, they are hyper-converged, but they also have just local storage for the ephemeral storage cases because this is where we think um, most, of the, this, most of the applications within Cloud Foundry are actually fine without um, any cinder volume. So they, they, they are already built distributed and horizontal scalable, so we can really then just quickly spawn on, on local cheap ephemeral storage. The control plane, we, at the first, when we looked at it, we wanted to have kind of like separating many of the things within many of the network. It become, became very quickly, very complicated, so uh, we went with a simpler approach. We just went with one network which is not totally true because there's, we're, we have a separate um, network for the storage traffic so that we can at least apply QoS more simply um, on, on storage, which becomes important if you go with a hyper-converged approach. And then um, if you look at the services within the control plane, we were grouping them more or less by, by major components. And then one of the decisions we also made is for example, Horizon requires memcached for, for caching um, of session and things like that. So um, we took there the approach that helper or supporting services that are like only for one particular role, we put them on the role itself. So no need to have to separate them um, as well. And in general, we started really with small-sized virtual machines. Like, I think every machine got more or less only two Vive CPUs and four gigs of memory. We then later tuned things up a little bit more, So, which is also the nice thing if you're on a virtualized control plane um, because then um, you can either say we go horizontally, but you can also have minor adjustments um, more in a vertical layer where it makes sense depending on, on the kind of workload that is running on an individual node. If you then look at uh, the life cycle, so within, within our cloud environment, we have a whole framework based around CICD. So we have, we have multiple stages where in one we develop things, a huge rate of breakage, and then um, the more it goes towards production, it becomes 
we only push the releases that actually <coughs> prove to be stable that went through testing and uh, this gives us really confidence to actually iterate quickly on, on, on new changes. Also, I think this is very important um, and always to note is that we, we strongly believe, believe that should there, there should be a clean separation between code and configuration. So the only things that differentiate between the, the various stages are the configuration for the particular stage like DNS servers, NTP server, or the actual IP addresses, but the code, it's packaged once at the very beginning as part of the CI process, and then we only push static artifacts through, through the different stages. So code never changes um, when it's pushed through the changes, because otherwise you will never know what, what actually, you're not able to compare the two. Um, for, for our automation, we, um, we use Puppet. We also started to develop um, a Puppet deployment orchestrator, which um, helps us surrounding more orchestration around Puppet. Nowadays, uh, probably a lot of people um, are usually like using Puppet for configuration management and Ansible for orchestration. Our Puppet deployment orchestrator does goes all also uh, more, it, it also creates all the VMs within the virtualized environment and um, takes care of their life cycle. So this gives them also the possibility that we actually can also describe a deployment of such a control plane as, as a piece of code, which then can also, again, being generated and similar to, and being fed from a similar tool like um, AT&T's tool that they um, presented various times now at the summit that is just um, the storage of all the configuration data and then you can generate all the remaining code and even configuration data from it. This also gives us the possibility to easily scale out purely on API calls. For storage, as I mentioned, um, we're running hyperconverged compute nodes. We're using Scale.io from EMC underneath. Um, Scale.io is really nice because it scales with the amount of disks that you put into it, and so also with the amount of servers. And then object storage, um, we're not doing object storage as part of OpenStack. Um, at Swisscom, we already have a huge Atmos installation which provides us object storage replicated over four data centers. So there was really like no need to, to um, develop object storage services as part of the OpenStack. And then Glance uses an object store usually. And if you want to like have multiple Glance storage nodes, which, which is something that you would like to have in the HA environment. We're actually then using again Atmos as an S3 backend, so we're pushing the images to Atmos once they are uploaded, and then we have caches on, on the glance nodes, so that when people start, are starting to, to launch VMs, um, then they get cached lo locally on the stack, but we can lose that everything, so we can just throw away the VMs. <coughs> um, as part of our um, stack, we're also giving, we're also running a SDN. It's from PlumGrid. It also was really a, an important part, given um, the scalability needs that we saw with with the MyCloud approach, um, because they they are really pushing a lot of data. So we needed a distributed network. Um, services so that like the data plane really scales with the amount of servers that we put in. This is then how it looks like usually. So um, on more on the left hand side we have supported uh, supporting services like uh, Puppet Master or Pulp Repository Server. Then we have a, this control plane which is part of our Arista layer 3 fabric. There, like all the VMs are, are attached, um, HAProxy, Nova, Keystone, 
and so forth. And all these VMs, they are running on top of a Red Hat Enterprise virtualization cluster, so which has its own scale IO storage. So we're actually like having two virtualization cluster. Ref is more the traditional virtualization cluster with features from um, that you know from VMware and things like that. Um, on the, we could also put it on another OpenStack. We could also put it on, on a VMware cluster. It doesn't really matter. It, it was what, what was easy to build for us and what also made sense for us. Then we have a separate network, the storage network within the data plane, um, which, which is then connecting all the storage service. So, for example, Cinder requires access to that storage network so it, that it can talk to all the scale IO SDSs. Then we have like the huge box, all the compute nodes from OpenStack where um, the tenants are running on top and then the Plum Grid gateways being um, the gateway between the virtualized world and the external physical world, um, meaning then the outside internet being routed or, or another department or so. Access within the fabric is kind of like separated, but given that we still want to, to access OpenStack API and things from within tenants, um, we're bridging there as well into that and, and are using a PAN firewall to secure the access. Yeah, so maybe let's look now that we have a, an overview of our design. It was also quite a journey going on and Alberto will give you more insights into like the various things that we encountered, things that maybe worked well, things that we saw that where OpenStack services are not yet ready. Yeah, the, the whole point is that we lack, we, we lack uh, field experiences. So we, we were unable to anticipate the problems we did in the, in the hard way. So we designed it, we deployed it, we ran it, we failed, we come back to the design phase, deploy it again, fail again, and so on. So th that's the whole point of coming here and share this experience with you. So you, you, you are able to anticipate these problems if you go for this architecture. So let's start with the first one. We are aiming for a stateless architecture. We are aiming for an active-active architecture without any clustering software. Guess what? Cinder volume is not prepared for active-active configurations. So we had to decide. Are we going to production without HA in this important component? Because this is the component that handles the life cycle of the, of the, of the volumes, of the persistent storage. So there is a commitment from the community to fix that. So we, we thought, OK, let's create a small pacemaker cluster only for this role, and we will get rid of it once it, uh, it gets better. So if you, if you are curious and you want to see what's going on, you can go to this, uh, to this link. The is, uh, this uh, is documented by the guy who is assigned to solve this, uh, this issue. So it's very comprehensive and you will get a, a quite good view of what's happening. And bootstrapping clusters. So these components, when uh, uh, after a complete failure of, or no, after the whole cluster goes down, they require some manual intervention to come back online. So we found the, Mar the, the, Mar the, the that Calera cluster if uh, the whole cluster goes down, you, you have to identify the, the node with the last uh, data. You have to bootstrap the cluster on that, uh, with that node, and then you have to join the other cluster members to the cluster. With RabbitMQ, it happens something similar. You, uh, you have to boot it in order. So if the whole cluster goes down, you have to identify which node was the last one going, uh, going down and bootstrap the cluster with this node being the first one, and then join the other nodes. If you cannot identify at the proper order, you have to reset the cluster by removing the amnesia database, which is not recommendable, but is the only way to recover it. And MongoDB, it, it happens that it, you know you get this fancy error saying the cluster was done in an unclear way, and you have to execute this repair uh, procedure to to bring the cluster up again. So we don't have uh, this uh, again. We don't have a pacemaker. We don't have something that automates all these steps. So you find it in the in the in the in the hardware, and you have to prepare your procedure. You have to prepare automation code for for recovering that. And this is what 
Marcel is going to speak. Yeah, so simply we don't have any magical recovery. So um, it becomes very important that within such uh, horizontally distributed control plane, you're actually monitoring the health of your various components. Um, we're using console for that. We're using console also as part of the deployment and the service discovery, which also helps us to further orchestrate um, deployments. We can do things like the, um, the first Galera cluster can set up Galera and MariaDB and the other ones are waiting and then joining the Galera cluster afterwards. So we can like really orchestrate these things in between. And it also gives us service discovery and at the same time also the service health, which we can then consume these events in an event processing engine, which um, is a own project that we started. It's called Orchard. It's based, it's in, in its core, it's based on Riemann. And it, it is then able to see wh what kind of failures are going on within your system. And then it can actually go out and, and like starting remediation tasks. So, so we, we're looking into automating more of the recovery processes in an automated way within Orchard so that when Orchard detects some patterns that we see at some time, it, it really goes in and, and does it automatically without any operators um, doing it manually. Yeah. So maybe um, it's also time to look a little bit at the benefits and the drawbacks that, that we saw in general making a summary of, of um, this overall architecture and our experience. Yeah, so the first one is, okay, is that we achieve our goal. We had our client-like architecture. We can, we, can, we can treat the control, the control services as stateless applications because we don't have any stateful component that prevent us to do that. We can operate them in a similar way that we operate uh, cloud workloads. We can forget about doing backups because the, 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 it will only back a configuration and the configuration is in the, in the automation code. We have a dynamic and an agile control, control plane so we can scale out, we can scale, we can scale up, we can do whatever we want because we are running virtual machines, we are deploying them with, uh, with uh, we are managing the control plane as a code. We, can, we just need to call an API to deploy a new, a new virtual machine. So easy stuff. And it's a cost effective solution. Everyone knows that the virtual, virtual environments are the best way to save resources because you have this fancy stuff that is called over commitment. So you can consume more resources than the available resources. You can configure more resources than the available resources in the underlying infrastructure. And the control plane does not depend on the infrastructure. So you can do life cycle on the hypervisor where the control plane are running without impacting the, the control plane. You can even, if you don't want to continue with the, your current virtual, virtual environment vendor, you can, you can move these workloads to a new virtual, virtual environment because this is, the, this is one of the greenness of virtual, of virtual machines. Yeah, and especially also um, we saw a lot of opportunities and, and actually benefits when, when we lo look at cloud like day two operations because um, we're, we're now having, um, we're now having that this distributed architecture, we can actually like treat the individual components and scale them um, more separately. But also like, so we started really with the minimal set of services and now we're starting to onboard new services. So actually onboarding new OpenStack services to, to an OpenStack cloud is just becoming, you just deploy, deploy new roles and you don't like need to care to integrate them in, into an existing deployment. Also, we're actually thinking that although we, we think we, our upgrade path should different, but something that we saw is that you could actually start deploying a whole set of, of a newer version of the control plane and then just moving things over where with a bare metal approach, this would require new resources while on a virtualized environment, you can just uh, shift things over to the new VMs and then take the old one down. Also, um, 
and but Al Alberto already mentioned that the only thing that we really back up are only the user data. So it's more or less the database dumps and all the other things are just coming out of automation. And if we have nodes that are in a weird state or are just, you don't know whatever happened to them, you don't know what people might have run on it or, or so to, to debug things and you're unsure whether this VM is still in a clean state, you just throw them away and restage them and actually this can happen without any interruption of the service itself because we, we have HAProx in front which, will, which we can drain and then take, take the node down, redeploy it and once it's up again, um, HAProxy will just get it back. Yeah, the drawbacks. So we have seen that since the volume is not uh, active active ready, so we, we have our pacemaker cluster running there. So hopefully we will be able to, to remove it soon. Galera cluster, Galera is the same thing. We have the seller for updates stuff that creates logs in the database. So you have to configure it in active hot standby way using HA proxy. Also, MariaDB and RabbitNQ don't scale horizontally, or the same happens to Cinder Volume, because if it's active passive, if you deploy 100 nodes, you will have only one active. And the, the, uh, with MariaDB and RabbitNQ happens that if you add more, 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 more nodes, you will have more, 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 more replication overhead and less performance. And in the case of MariaDB, it has no point. You are only talking to one database due to the, the HA proxy model in, in active standby hot standby. So we have the no magical, no magical recovery, so we don't have anything that take care about the services. So if the Cinder API goes down, it will be down. So you will, you will need, to, you, you need to have monitoring, uh, monitoring system that see, that send you an alarm and then automation code that bring up the service again or trained operators or, or whatever. The same happens with the bootstrap, with the bootstrap of clusters. The, you lose the, if the whole Calera cluster goes down, you need something to bring it up. Um, network partitions and Kipal ID. So Kipal ID is based in BRRP, and BRRP uses multicast message to, to coordinate the VIPs across the nodes. So if node A loses connection with node B, node B yeah, and node A is the, is the active one, node B will uh, stop seeing the messages from the node A. And we say, hey, I'm the master, and you will end up in in uh, spleen braided scenarios. You can mitigate this risk by providing HA in the network infrastructure, so bondings and bondings and bondings and bondings. And something that I forgot to mention is that we use run robin DNS to split the, to distribute the load across the different HA proxies, because otherwise it's point that you have only one BIP, so you are only talking with, with one HA proxy. So if you can do, if you do dynamic uh, run robin DNS, you can point, you can distribute the load across HA proxy, but with Horizon you cannot because you don't want the user logging in every time it talks to Horizon. You have to create a sticky sessions based on cookies, so this service cannot benefit from the from the active, active, active model with uh, round robin DNS. So, if we look a little bit at future work, um, we would like to start first with a call out to all the OpenStack developers, like. Um, something where we would really ask you to keep in mind we're building a cloud so um, we should also build the services in a um, cloud native style so it would be good to get services um, being built active active from the beginning on because if we see the the discussions happening regarding cinder volume it it starts to becoming more and more pain once the, the service was more and more established and also something that we saw and like we built in, for example, for HA proxy, we built in health probe for, for Galera in the back. So like um, having health endpoints where you can query the services, are you healthy or not? And not only um, would be really helpful to keep that running because otherwise um, um, it's, it's kind of unclear. I mean, what do you check? Like, HTTP return code 200, so as soon as a 500 <coughs> gets fired back, it, it's a failure and then we're taking you out, but a 200 sometimes also just means it just sends you the list of, of service endpoints. So, so having healthiness endpoints where you can ask each service, are you healthy or not, would be really helpful for, for integrating more into HA proxy. 
Um, when we started, and so actually if you look at, at this architecture taking all the pieces apart, it's, I mean, we could also model things just within containers. We, we started with this approach one and a half years ago, and at that time, A, um, containers were not yet that major, and especially container scheduling were not major enough yet. But we definitely saw at this summit that a lot of um, things happened within that part, um, the project Cola evolved really a lot. Um, there are now schedulers around like Kubernetes. We, we saw many presentations showing the, um, how they work together. So um, this is something maybe we um, are considering for the future that, um, that to, to, use, to rather package the service not within individual VMs, but just in containers so that we would even get rid of the overhead of a VM. But this is something that we will definitely investigate. And something other is also the usual discussion um, about hyperconverged storage or not. At the moment, we're not seeing any bottlenecks within our setup when it comes to the hyperconverged storage. So it's um, if, if, if we talk about performance. We, we see other challenges w when it comes to hyperconverged storage, but like the usual reasons for it being performance or memory exhausting on the compute nodes. We don't have the problem at the moment, so, so therefore it's not that high on the priority list to reconsider that decision, but it might be something that comes up. Yeah, and the, that's it from our side. Thanks a lot for listening, and I guess we might still have some time for questions. No. No, good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Otherwise, please come up and um, you can ask us here.